Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, another installment of Access Safety, uh, MARO's web-based uh, safety training series that's presented in partnership with MIOSHA's Consultation, Education, and Training Division. Um, we're very fortunate to uh, have this partnership with MIOSHA, and we appreciate their support. The main topic this morning uh, will be ergonomics. We'll talk a little bit about a specific application of ergonomics as well uh, with regard to back injury prevention, but we'll begin with an overview of the subject of ergonomics uh, with some definitions of the topic, talk a little bit about uh, the status of um, where MIOSHA stands on the issue of ergonomics, uh, both on a regulatory basis and through uh, guidelines that they help employers establish. The main objective for ergonomics programs is injury prevention, and we'll talk about what some of the risk factors are for those injuries, the types of injuries that can result uh, if those uh, risks are not paid attention to. We'll focus on strategies uh, for preventing them. Uh, if you have any questions as we go along this morning, please feel free to, um, to ask. And uh, if you prefer to hold your questions to the end, that's fine too. I'll be available for consultation afterwards. The subtitle or soundbite um, for ergonomics is fitting jobs to people, and that's the main focus, is structuring the work environment to uh, make a person as comfortable as possible, really, while they're performing their task. It means that we design or modify not just the job, but the entire workplace, including the equipment, uh, the methods that are used, and any tools that are deployed to match the capabilities of the worker. And the ultimate goal of that process is injury prevention. Um, where MIOSHA stands uh, on uh, ergonomics changed fairly dramatically last year. Um, there had been a federal ergonomics standard proposed about 12 years ago um, that uh, didn't last very long. Um, MIOSHA, the Michigan has its own uh, state plan for occupational safety and health regulations. And after years of discussion and debate, uh, MIOSHA actually drafted uh, a standard, a regulation, a couple of years ago that would have created minimum requirements for all folks in the general industry category, which is the majority of employers, that have employees with exposure to ergonomic hazards. And again, that would be the majority. The minimum requirements that uh, the standard would have established was basically a, a training component that uh, employers create an awareness program uh, and a process for assessing and, uh, more importantly, responding to any uh, ergonomic occupational risk factors. Um, the training was to consist of the very basics, what those risk factors are, the signs and symptoms that would indicate a problem, uh, an established process for reporting a hazard or a problem, and again, uh, a documented process that showed uh, an employee a fulfilled responsibility to respond to those risk factors that would include involving employees and eliminating the hazards. Um, unfortunately, or, or not, depending on your point of view, um, the, there will not be a MIOSHA standard uh, on ergonomics uh, based on a promise that was made during the campaign when uh, Governor Snyder was elected. He actually signed a bill uh, into law that prohibits the promulgation of a workplace ergonomics standard. Now, while the standard is banned, uh, the, the law, the bill does um, allow for MIOSHA, the state regulatory agency, to issue guidance and best practice information on workplace ergonomics, but the agency is prohibited from issuing an actual regulation um, on the grounds that um, they would not be able to exceed uh, federal OSHA recommendations, and federal OSHA does not have an ergonomic standard. In fact, uh, California is the only uh, state in the union that does. Now, my OSHA will consistently um, advocate for sound ergonomic practices, and uh, it's really been shown over the last 15 to 20 years that when employers do pay attention to these issues, injury rates do ultimately go down and the costs associated uh, with those injuries go down as well. So it's really become fairly well accepted as, as, a, as a good practice, particularly in, in general industry, uh, and MIOSHA will continue to operate under, those, uh, under that assumption. It's just that there will not be a regulation. Uh, 
so that's the regulatory standpoint. Uh, in terms of the practical information, uh, again, we're trying to deal with the keeping people from getting hurt at work as it relates to certain types of injuries and the risks for those injuries. And with ergonomics, the, many of the risk factors are associated with uh, repetitive tasks, and a high rate of repetition is probably the primary risk factor for ergonomic injury. If you apply force to that, uh, it's just common sense, then the risk will increase. Uh, if you have to engage the same muscle group over and over again, eventually those muscles will fatigue. The force that's applied if you're doing it, uh, lifting, for example, a heavy object, um, the, uh, the risk increases with a combination of force and repetition. Extremes of temperature uh, and other environmental factors can play a role as well. Temperature tends to be more the case when um, temperatures are cold. Uh, because a person can, muscles contract, they don't become flexible as quickly, and the risk for strain increases. And as well, in cold temperatures, um, folks can, uh, to compensate for that, can tend to, um, in an attempt to preserve their own body heat, can put themselves in a bit of an awkward posture to begin with. Um, the, the heat tends not to be as significant a risk factor as it relates to ergonomics. Uh, vibration and impact, use of tools that vibrate uh, or operating equipment that vibrates. For example, uh, folks who operate uh, trucks over the road uh, because of the vibration um, are more susceptible uh, quite often to back injuries, and it's because of the vibration. Uh, impact, especially if it's in a focused area, and I specifically mentioned here direct pressure to the palm of the hand, uh, the soft tissue in that area is very susceptible uh, to, to damage if uh, direct pressure is placed in a small focused area, and that can translate to, to problems with other uh, muscles in the upper extremities as well. And the pinch grip, the grip uh, basically that you apply if you're writing with a pen or pencil, particularly if that's a forceful pinch grip, can increase the risk uh, for injuries associated with those muscles in the hand and risk, wrist. Um, Additional risk factors associated with repetition include the number of hours worked per day or per shift. Some personal risk factors involve the level, uh, the employee's level of conditioning and physical fitness. And this is one that uh, some folks don't like to talk about much because they think it's outside um, the obligation or area of responsibility for the employer. And I, I disagree. I think that we can create an environment where folks can uh, pr um, offer some conditioning to the muscles at least that they're using uh, to perform specific tasks at work, particularly as it relates to keeping those muscle groups flexible. So offering the chance for some flexibility exercises and stretches, um, I think can go a long way towards preventing ergonomic injury and we'll spend a bit of time on that while we're together this morning. Uh, and as well, an individual's capacity for recovery um, will vary from person to person and um, it's part of why uh, there's such a difficulty with ergonomic risk factors is there, there's a variety of body types, uh, capacities for recovery, fitness levels, and there's also a variety of uh, different risk factors. In addition to repetition that I began with, probably the two other most significant risk factors are poor posture and bad body mechanics. Posture is simply the position that our bodies are in when we're not moving and body mechanics is the position that we're in when we are moving, particularly when we're lifting. Some of the target areas for these risk factors, um, muscle groups that can be at risk of injury include the upper extremities, hands, wrists, all the way up to elbows, shoulders, and uh, the neck and lower back as well. And with a focus or an eye towards um, posture and body mechanics, I'm going to provide a few diagrams for you here that show some positions uh, to avoid and those that would be preferred as it relates to those muscle groups. First with the hand and wrist, any uh, strong uh, deviation of the wrist, in this particular case it's a downward um, bend, should be avoided. The hand should be in a natural or neutral position as a natural extension of the forearm, similar the, to the position that we're in when we extend uh, an arm to shake hands. Uh, again, any uh, severe bending uh, or twisting in either direction, you see this um, with the wrist bent forward to be avoided, rather, uh, again, a natural extension. And uh, any time the palms 
uh, are facing directly upward towards the ceiling or sky. Um, it's a stressful position to begin with, and we, if we add repetitive tasks, particularly if they're, if they're forceful, that can increase the risk of injury. So again, uh, preferred position is a natural extension of the forearm with palms as much as possible facing downward. Another red flag that we try to look out for, and this is particularly true with assembly tasks, is to keep uh, the elbows hanging naturally at our side. Anytime the elbows, uh, the red flag is if the elbows are out away from the body, as you see in the diagram here, particularly the case if an individual has to reach into a container to perform some packaging work or perhaps inspection, um, is to be avoided. So we like to see the elbows hanging more naturally uh, at our side in this particular case. Uh, we could accommodate that either by um, lowering the height of the container or perhaps changing its angle so that the worker could approach uh, the materials inside without extending the elbows out away from the body. Um, with uh, lower back, and we'll talk about this more when we deal with back injury prevention, it's a pretty basic red flag, and that is flexing forward uh, at the waist. Um, it significantly increases the load on the muscles of the lower back, seven to 10 times the weight of the object being lifted is the amount of force that's applied to the lower back. If we bend forward to pick something up from floor level. So instead, we keep the back in its natural upright position as much as possible and bend at the knees to reach the object that we uh, need to lift or move. And back to upper extremities. Um, when folks have to do work, it's not possible to remain at rest all the time, but as much as possible, we like to see the uh, not just the elbows close to the body, but the arms as, as, uh, as naturally um, or neutral as possible. And you see a better, uh, a worse with the elbows, excuse me, the hands extended directly out from the shoulders. And the main condition to avoid for uh, shoulder burdening is um, reaching above shoulder level consistently, particularly if a person has to apply force or lift or move an object above shoulder level. That's a red flag that indicates we might want to take a closer look at that job and see if some adjustments could be made. And when you add this all up, um, uh, we use a term called cumulative trauma um, or repetitive strain injury. Um, and this is the, the phrase that's used to describe quite often ergonomic injuries. They are now the most common occurring in the workplace and they're referred to as cumulative because they don't uh, result from a single event. Rather, it's damage that accumulates, that builds up over an extended period of time. Uh, quite often, we're uh, behaving in ways that uh, is damaging to our bodies, and we don't realize it, and that's the bad news about ergonomic risk factor. At least we don't feel symptoms. Um, but the good news is that by understanding some of these causes, particularly posture and body mechanics, and making some changes, uh, we can do things a little bit differently and hopefully reduce the chance for getting hurt. And that's the whole point of ergonomics. What we can do specifically, we focus on three uh, areas. The first is to pay some attention to the best posture and body mechanics that the environment will allow. So basically awareness training of good posture, good body mechanics in a variety of different um, situations. When that environment is challenging, we change it. And that's kind of the heart and soul of the workstation design part of ergonomics. If we make adjustments to the tools that are being used or the way that the workstation is laid out or designed um, to create a situation where the worker does not have to put themselves in that awkward posture or use bad body mechanics. And lastly, we help our bodies tolerate uh, the tasks that we're asking them to perform through basic exercise and conditioning. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, first, though, to the workplace or workstation design element. Uh, we've got kind of an old school drawing here of a basic seated uh, assembly workstation that has several ergonomic components to it. Starting at the top with task lighting. If uh, a work area is not well lit, it not only creates visibility and potential quality issues for the operator, um, but can also lead that person to put themselves in a more awkward position to perform the task to, to see well, to achieve a better sight line. So good lighting, even task lighting that you see here is important. Um, you see that uh, the tools, um, starting with the, uh, uh, the driver or the air gun there that's hung from a balancer that's got a couple of ergonomic features to it. The balancer is one of them that basically um, 
significantly reduces actually the amount of force that's required to operate that tool uh, because it doesn't need to be picked up, placed, and then returned to its station. Um, but rather it, it hangs from the balancer and it's a matter of grasping the tool, uh, bringing it to the point of engagement, and then allowing it to return to the balancer without much um, effort or force being extended. And you see also that that's a straight-handled tool so that the grip this operator would use to, oper to uh, use the tool um, would be a natural extension of their forearm. If that were a standard um, L-shaped or gun-type handled uh, drill or driver, then to apply uh, the tool to a horizontal surface like the table here, they would have to put their wrist in a very awkward, uh, uncomfortable position. So a couple of ergonomic features with that tool. Um, the table itself has some ergonomic features. It has a, a tilt function so that the angle can be adjusted for, uh, to accommodate um, both um, visibility and body mechanics, uh, similar to um, the box that we saw earlier with the elbow. Um, the operator had their elbows extended out. This would be a way of accommodating that, is adjusting the angle. And this also is a height adjustable table. And with some of the other tools and materials, all are within an easy reach, or what's called a swing space with ergonomics, minimizing the amount, basically, of reaching, bending, or twisting, Keep the, keeping the person in as natural or neutral a position as possible uh, to keep them as comfortable as possible, but ultimately prevent repetitive strain. And the chair also has some ergonomic features um, uh, as well with uh, good support for the lower or lumbar area uh, of the back. For folks in more of an administrative environment, uh, ergonomics plays a big role with computer use as well. I'll give you a quick uh, outline of a good workstation design components for computer use. The first has to do with the position of the monitor, where we generally like to see it directly in front of the user and have the main focal point, which is the top of the screen, not the top of the monitor itself, but the top of the screen at or slightly below eye level. Um, and again, position directly in front of the user. If any transcription is being done, if we're looking at one document while entering data, it's good to have a document holder rather than placing the documents on the desktop or worse yet, on the lap or on the floor. Um, it keeps that point of visibility directly adjacent to the monitor so that the, it minimizes the bending and twisting of the neck and shoulders. With keyboard placement, there's a couple of considerations, uh, both height and distance. And the end result that we like to see is having the elbow in a uh, L-shaped or 90-degree um, angle. Let me see here is the, the angle that we're paying attention to. Um, the elbow's in, arms hanging naturally um, at the computer operator's side, but the, the, the angle is a 90-degree or L-shaped. And uh, she's not reaching out, therefore, um, or extending arms to get to the keyboard. So it's at a height and a distance with the 90 degree bend in the elbow and the wrists uh, well supported so that they're um, in a good natural neutral position. Uh, this uh, person appears to be blessed with a good posture uh, without supports. Um, for those of us uh, who might not uh, be quite so gifted, the wrist pad or support in front of the keyboard is a good accessory to provide to folks if they're doing a lot of uh, computer use. And again, with the chair features, uh, safety feature, first of all, is that if it's on wheels, it ought to have five points, what this one does, and also um, that it provides good lower back or lumbar support. And adjustability, if it's possible, not always possible with computer or any workstation, really, um, but allowing for to accommodate a variety of uh, sizes and, and postures for the user is a good ergonomic feature. Uh, tools as well can play uh, an important role to selection and design, and I have some drawings here, some uh, uh, pictures of very basic tools that have some ergonomic accommodations, starting with the needle nose pliers that have the bent pinch point so that the wrist doesn't have to bend, the paintbrush that has the contoured handle so that the pinch grip that's used to uh, grasp that tool, we can, that can be done with uh, minimal force. Uh, the self-opening scissors, which basically cuts the amount of force and the amount of uh, effort that needs to be exerted in half um, because the tool does have to work for you. And then with the knife, the cutting blade with a bent or 90-degree handle, kind of the opposite of the straight handle with the driver tool that we looked at earlier, 
this allows uh, the person to draw the, uh, the knife back towards them, cutting uh, flooring perhaps or material, and maintaining that wrist in a natural or neutral position. So the way that we arrange the tools, materials, uh, the stuff that we use frequently during the course of the day plays a big part um, in avoiding the, the awkward postures that can create problems with ergonomic injuries. There are other types of control measures that we can apply and administrative control uh, that's quite often used to reduce the number of repetitions if it's by nature a repetitive task, which is not uncommon in a manufacturing environment, uh, is to um, either provide some assistive automation, which would be more of an engineering control, or a job rotation strategy, which is kind of an administrative control, where if in a given work cell, for example, if there's a lot of assembly tasks involving fine motor skills and then some packaging tasks involving gross motor skills, and two separate folks are doing those jobs after a while, they could switch to vary uh, the demand on specific muscle groups um, and reduce the level of strain. And of course, training employees on the use of appropriate body mechanics and what it means to stay in the neutral zone um, uh, and remain in as comfortable a posture as possible. And that's, of course, particularly important with uh, material handling and lifting tasks. Uh, to design workstations and select tools to limit or avoid the awkward postures that can create problems. So those are the two of the three areas uh, in summary is um, focusing on awareness of good posture and body mechanics, structuring the work environment through uh, design to uh, make it easy to maintain those good postures, but then also incorporating some exercise programs for both strength and flexibility. And uh, I want to go through some examples of those uh, that can be done um, really without the expense of any type of gym membership, no equipment, uh, and no special apparel. It can be done right at the workstation, in fact. Some basic stretches. And strength building is great, as is aerobic exercise. Uh, I'm a big advocate that um, all those programs will reduce uh, the likelihood of work-related injuries, particularly ergonomic injuries. Uh, because uh, a higher fitness level will tend to reduce the impact of repetitive tasks. But there's also stretching uh, exercises that can be very beneficial, and an increased level of flexibility can reduce the chance for this type of injury. Whenever we are uh, encouraging folks to stretch, we should always remind them uh, to move gently using controlled movements. Um, if, if pain or discomfort is experienced, that's a sign that something's wrong, that we should discontinue the exercise and perhaps consult a doctor or a therapist. The no pain, no gain thing you hear applied to exercise is really a load of crap. If, if, uh, if it hurts, then something's wrong, and we need to do things differently. And if an individual is already experiencing pain or they're under care for a condition, then the advice about exercise needs to come from their health care provider. Uh, but for folks who are simply trying to do some uh, preventive exercises for healthy muscle groups, um, these are a few examples. And one that can uh, assist in reducing lower back tightness and discomfort is a basic lower back stretch. Many of us do almost instinctively when we've been seated for a long period of time and being in a static position can actually be as stressful to the lower back as uh, repetitive work. Uh, or if we have been moving or lifting stuff around quite a bit, the lower back stretch, which involves uh, placing your feet about shoulder width apart to maintain good balance, putting hands on hips, and then flexing gently backwards. And holding a stretch for 10 to 15 seconds um, is generally advised, and then return to an upright position. A side stretch um, uh, helps with flexibility of the accompanying muscle groups in that area of the core. Uh, again, shoulder, uh, feet shoulder width apart to maintain good balance, putting one hand directly overhead and then bending sideways in the opposite direction and holding for 10 or 15 seconds and then uh, repeating on the opposite side. Another muscle group that plays a role in preventing lower back pain is actually um, the one in the lower extremities, and that's the hamstring muscle that runs down the back of the leg. And a very basic stretch for that is depicted in the diagram. First, uh, grasping a sturdy or stable surface to make sure that, again, we maintain good balance. And then just elevating one foot to a surface higher than floor level. This is just a small wooden box that was used by this individual. And then flexing forward at the hips. You don't need to put your knee to your nose and you don't need to touch your toes, but just a gradual flex forward. And if you haven't done this in a while, if you haven't uh, performed a hamstring stretch, you'll feel it right away in a very focused way. 
Uh, so moving gently, but holding for about 10 to 15 seconds and then returning to an upright position and doing that with each leg. It can not only bring some flexibility to the lower extremities, but reduce the chance for lower back pain. With alignment issues that can lead to lower back pain, it's quite often found that folks in that condition also have very tight hamstring muscles. So this can be beneficial for both, both muscle groups. For hands and wrists, there's a couple of examples. This is the bilateral wrist or the prayer stretch, uh, placing hands together, um, maintaining contact at both the tips of the fingers and the palms of the hands, and then slowly bringing hands downward toward the waist and holding that for about five counts to begin with, particularly if repetitive work, which could be an assembly task, could be uh, keyboarding at a computer, is being done beginning uh, with a very slow, gradual movement and just holding this one for five seconds or so to begin with and then working your way up to 10 or 15 uh, is a good approach. And an alternate to that stretch for the same muscle group is the wrist extension, where one hand uh, is extended forward and then grasps the palm and the fingers together, so at the base of the fingers near the top of the palm, and gently bending backward and holding it for five counts uh, on each side. A few examples of some very simple stretches that, again, can be done right in the workplace, only take a few seconds to conduct, and actually can go a long way towards reducing the chance for repetitive strain or ergonomically related uh, injury. We'll move the focus then um, to uh, the specifics of back injury prevention, which is also quite often related to ergonomics. Back injuries uh, are very painful. Uh, they're expensive to treat. Uh, and it happens really more often than you think. We'll, we'll talk uh, briefly about some of the things that can cause back problems, very similar to the risk factors for other ergonomic injuries, and some specific ideas for things that we can do, again, to reduce the chance for getting hurt. With pain in the back, in the lower back in particular, the average cost of an injury uh, without surgical intervention is uh, between nine and $10,000, and with surgical uh, treatment with surgery, it's over 35 grand. It's very expensive to treat. If you've had a back injury before, you know that it's very painful and it doesn't, it's not just a work related issue. It doesn't stop hurting when you clock out. It affects the way that you live, the way that you're able to uh, interact with friends and family as well as your colleagues, whether you can be comfortable seated or eating or sleeping. Um, so, if there's things that we can do to reduce that kind of discomfort, I think it's time well spent. It's also a wise investment from an employer's perspective. The cost to U.S. industry and worker comp dollars alone every year exceeds $12 billion. Uh, it accounts for one out of every five or 20 percent of all workplace injuries, and actually four out of five or 80 percent of all Americans will suffer lower back pain at some point in their lives. And it's that pervasive, I think, because, as we discussed with ergonomics, there are so many different factors that can put our backs at risk, and they all add up. Posture and body mechanics, the amount of force um, that's applied when we're lifting or moving materials, if that's done repetitively, again, it increases the risk. Smoking makes the list here, which we didn't discuss uh, in a more general overview of ergonomics, and that's because folks who smoke introduced nicotine into their bloodstream, and that actually slows down the circulatory process, which is an integral part of the healing process. So when we look at back injuries as a cumulative problem, as a result of damage that builds up over time, the body's ability to heal itself is actually a preventive measure. So if we slow down that healing process, we're actually increasing the risk for experiencing symptoms from cumulative strain. The loss of flexibility, strength, and endurance that actually occurs uh, naturally as we age uh, can put our backs at increased risk. doesn't mean we have to accept it. Uh, and again, uh, some of those flexibility exercises can be very beneficial. Uh, and the degenerative process can also accompany aging, particularly uh, with the discs that separate the bones in our spine. Stress, as with any uh, cumulative uh, health-related issue, can increase the level of risk, as can uh, extended exposure to vibration. And it all adds up. This, uh, as with other ergonomically related injuries, are quite often cumulative. They don't uh, occur as a result of a single event. Sometimes it can be an event that triggers the symptoms. Anything from lifting an object with utilizing bad posture to the awkward position we put ourselves in when we sneeze can trigger the symptoms. But it's not the actual cause. Again, it's damage that builds up over time. And the shape our backs are in today is a result of habits that have been built up over time, both, both good and bad. 
and if our habits have involved uh, using our backs in very demanding ways, then those effects are adding up, especially as we age. Uh, but changing habits now, or at least starting to change, can help undo uh, some of that damage. So again, the things that we can do in the three specific areas are paying attention to the best posture and body mechanics the environment will allow. As it relates to back injury prevention, specifically that would be when sitting, when standing, uh, and especially when lifting. When the environment is challenging, we change it, and that's the workstation design part of ergonomics um, that we've talked about already. And again, helping our bodies to tolerate the tasks that we're asking them to perform through exercise and conditioning. To focus specifically on posture and body mechanics and lifting techniques here, um, a quick uh, sort of anatomy lesson here. The spine's natural position is curved. We're quite often told to stand up uh, straight or sit up straight, and that's not the way we're built. Um, there are natural curves to the spine, and this is the position that it's in when, it's, when the muscles are the strongest in support of that naturally curved position. Uh, it's where the bones, referred to as vertebrae, and the padding in between those bones, which are the discs that I referred to earlier, are able to absorb the most shock. It's the position our backs were designed to be in. And in essence, the more we use them uh, in the way that they're designed, maintaining this position, the, the better our chances to avoid injury. It's when we get out of this position that we start asking for trouble. And with posture, you see some examples of poor both seated and standing posture. And again, this is basically an awareness issue. If we find ourselves fatigued with shoulders um, moving forward, uh, chin drops a little bit, and pretty soon uh, the entire upper body is in a slouched position, which actually can end up uh, flattening out the critical curve in the lower or lumbar area of the spine, the area that's highlighted here um, in a, sort of a bluish gray that I've circled now is the area in our spine that's most at risk, um, both from poor posture, as you see both seated and standing on the left, but most especially from bad body mechanics. And that red flag that uh, we pointed out earlier, flexing forward, is the one that we want to specifically avoid. You mentioned some pretty uh, alarming statistics about the frequency of, of back pain. 80% of all Americans will experience it at some point in their lives. When we look at actual back injuries that already have occurred in the workplace, uh, an even greater number, 85% of those happened when the worker was to some degree flexed or bent forward at the waist, which is a pretty compelling statistic to avoid that position. So instead, what we like to see when folks are lifting or moving material is to, is to bend at the, um, at the knees rather than at the waist. Uh, a couple of strategies for, for performing that type of good lift that you see demonstrated at the bottom, the classic uh, bent knee lift, but also uh, the individual on the right goes to a knee uh, to lift a box from floor level. Um, and it basically with uh, safe lifting techniques comes down to avoiding that forward flexion uh, bending at the knees if we can, um, staying as upright as possible, and that's to protect that naturally curved position of our spine. If you do have to bend forward, uh, I know that quite often there are challenging environments for that, so we do have to flex forward a little bit. If that's the case, whether it be reaching into a container with tall sides, like some of the wire baskets used with the automotive industry, or reaching into the trunk of your car to get to your groceries. If you do have to bend forward to support your upper body weight, building a bridge using one of your arms to um, uh, place your hand on a sturdy or stable surface that actually supports the upper body weight, and that's what takes the load off um, our lower back so that the force that's exerted if we do bend forward isn't felt by the muscles uh, in that part of our back. When we do lift or carry, keep the load as close to the body. That will reduce uh, the amount of force that translates. And again, if you, if you bend forward or keep the load out away from our bodies, that can translate into seven to ten times the weight of the object being carried um, that's radiating to the lower back. So keep the load close and avoid the twisting motion when lifting or carrying. Instead, try to move your feet. A gentle twist when we're not weight-bearing um, is okay for a stretch, but when the spine is compressed, as it is when we're lifting or carrying, we want to avoid the twisting motion. So bending at the knees, keeping as upright as possible, keep the load close, and avoid the twisting motion are key components of safe lifting techniques. 
Um, I have a couple of other resources that uh, I can share with you um, this morning. Um, copies of this PowerPoint presentation will be available through um, the safety training page on the MARL website by the end of the day. And there's also access to some posters and handout materials that were produced in conjunction with one of our partners in the MARL Worker Comp Fund, um, Midwest Employers Casualty Company, that just serves as uh, reminders for safe lifting and carrying practices um, and posters to, uh, to encourage folks to use good technique. I'm a firm believer uh, that awareness translates into results. And these are just a couple of additional tools uh, in the box to help uh, you uh, remind folks about what the risk factors are for ergonomic-related injuries, particularly those associated uh, with back pain and utilizing good uh, lifting and carrying techniques. So thanks for spending time with us this morning. Does anybody have any questions before we sign off? All right, folks, thanks very much for tuning in. If you have questions that uh, you prefer to ask privately, um, you can hang on the line or um, just give me a call uh, when we sign off here. Thanks for tuning in, and be careful out there. Thanks, Todd. Good job. Thanks, Dean. Take care. Bye. <clears throat>